Good morning. Welcome to Bear Creek. We're glad you're here. Come on and stand as we ready our hearts to worship the Lord. Here we go. We worship you, Lord. together strange as neighbors our blood is one children of generations of every nation of kingdom come so don't let your heart be troubled One truth, God is barely in love with you. So take courage, hold on, oh, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Jesus. That's what I love about Bear Creek, that we can all come together, people from just different backgrounds. We don't all look alike, but we can all come under the, the banner of Jesus Christ and worship Him. So let's do that today. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Oh, 
Amen. Well, that's what we've gathered today to do, to put our trust in Him, to trust Him even more and more. And we're so excited that, um, that He's just invited us into His presence this morning. Amen. He's going to do an incredible work, a miraculous work. In fact, He's doing that already even now. Uh, today, there, there's a few that have come to be baptized in the waters as they place their faith in Jesus Christ, decide to follow Him. So I'm going to ask you to take your seat as we celebrate with those, and let's focus our attention to the screens. Good morning, church. This is my brother in Christ, Dylan James. Dylan, what is your profession of faith? Uh, I, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Hey, Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So my brother, it, it's my privilege and my honor this morning, open your profession of faith, to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations. And this is my brother in Christ, Daryl James. What is your profession of faith, my brother? This is Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. <laughs> it's my privilege to baptize you upon your profession of faith in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is my brother in Christ, Doug Doom. What is your profession of faith, my brother? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. <laughs> so it's my privilege, my brother, upon your profession of faith, to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Esta es mi hermana Adria Leiva. Adria, ¿tú has creído en Jesucristo como tu Salvador y tu Señor personal? Sí. Pues es mi privilegio, mi hermana, basado en tu profesión de fe, bautizarte esta mañana en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Felicidades. Esta es mi hermana Milena Camacho. Milena Camargo. Camargo. ¿Tú confiesas que has recibido a Jesucristo como tu Salvador y tu Señor? Sí, lo confieso. Pues es mi privilegio, mi hermana, basado en tu profesión de fe, bautizarte esta mañana en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Felicidades. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we're so excited today, church. First up is Miss Noah Burke. Noah is an eight-year-old, and she comes today declaring her faith in Jesus. Yeah, we can celebrate that. Noah, you hear that? We're so excited for you. <laughs> and so, Noah, I just have one question for you today. Noah, what is your testimony of faith? Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. No, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Come on, way to go, Noah. Amen. Next up, we have Brianna Bustos. Brianna is a, she's going to junior, junior year at Cy Park. And uh, we're so excited to celebrate with you today, Brianna. We also have coming into the baptistry, her father is going to be baptized today as well. This is our churro. We're going to baptize him in a minute. So they're together. Come on. <laughs> Brianna, I have one question for you. What is your testimony of faith? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Come on. <laughs> Brianna, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Bear with Christ in baptism, raised to walk and the newness of life. Come on, you can step right here, step right here. And next up we have dad, Arturo, Arturo Bustos. He comes today declaring his faith in Jesus as his daughter does as well. Arturo, one question for you, man. What is your testimony of faith? Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. 
Come on, Arturo, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's my honor, brother, to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Come on. Bless you, brother. Bless you. Bless you. We got two more at this portion. We have, uh, next up is Aiden Laws. Aiden is a recently graduated senior. Come on, you hear that? Recently graduated senior, and he comes today as he gets ready to head off to college, and he says, I want to put my faith, declare it publicly in Jesus. So Aiden, what is your testimony of faith this morning? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Come on. What a blessing. Aiden, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it's my honor to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Woo! Come on. And last up at this section, church, we have Mr. Samuel Taylor. Samuel is a recently graduated senior as well. Come on, Samuel, you hear that? And he comes today declaring his faith in Jesus. Sam, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Come on, man. Upon your public profession of faith, Sam, it is my honor to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Yes, so up now at church we have uh, Jolie Lamont. Jolie is a recently graduated senior. Come on. Oh, you hear that? And she comes today declaring her faith in Jesus. So Jolie, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Come on. Well, Jolie, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Come on. Next up, we have Kylie Mitchell. Kylie is a junior, going to be a senior at Cy Park, and Kylie comes today declaring her faith in Jesus. Come on. Kylie, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. <laughs> Kylie, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Come on. Next up, we have Sophia Romano. Sophia is also a junior, going to be a senior at Cy Park. And Sophia comes today making the same declaration. Sophia, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Come on. <laughs> Sophia, it's my honor. Upon your public profession of faith, is Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. It's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism raised to walk in the newness of life. Congratulations. And we got one more today, church. We have uh, Janet Picardo. Picardo. I almost had it right. Almost had it right. Janet is also a recently graduated senior. And, uh, and she comes today. And she, her and her fiance have been here for about six months. And she says, I'm ready to walk, take this step of baptism. So Janet, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Come on. Janet, upon your public profession of faith, as Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Congratulations. Uh, the baptizer there uh, is Ivan Garcia, our pastor of Bear Creek in Spanish, and he just baptized the first five uh, today. We're going to baptize a total of 12 people today in our services, and we ought to just say thank you to the Lord for that. It's incredible because uh, it, it's the outcome of sharing the gospel. And all, all of our ministries uh, in the last few weeks uh, this summer in our student ministry and children's ministry, adult ministry, Spanish ministry. I mean, it's been an amazing uh, several weeks of people just coming to know Christ and then now following him in baptism. It's just an incredible thing. And it just, it, that just means so much to me to know that I get to be a part of this church, this church that is not just existing. It's not just sort of going through the motions of church, but it's seeing life change and it's seeing people people's lives transformed, and we get to see that over and over and over uh, in the baptistry. And so don't take that for granted. I mean, savor that and see the, the rich thing that that uh, actually is. Well, hey, listen, if you're new to Bear Creek, I want to say welcome. Thank you so much for being in this service. You're in one of four Sunday morning services we experience uh, every single Sunday. And if you are new, 
I'd love it if you would let us know you're here. And you can do that in a couple of ways. You can grab your phone and text the word MORE to 84576, and you could let us know that you're here. Or there's a welcome card in the seat back in front of you, and you could just fill that out uh, really uh, uh, quickly or briefly. You can drop it in the offering plate, or if you'll take it to the welcome desk, our info desk, uh, we, have a, we have a welcome gift we would love for you to have. And so it would mean a lot to us if you would let us know, uh, if you'd let us know that you're here. Hey, listen, um, I want to tell you about something I'm going to start in two weeks. So two weeks from now, I'm going to begin a brand new teaching series. It's going to be super short, really short, but a, a new teaching series called Influencer. So do you know who the greatest, do you know the most important influencer in the world today? And if your answer is Mr. Beast, you would be wrong about that. Okay, hey, hey, let's have a moment of honesty here. I mean, be like really honest. Uh, I don't know who Mr. Beast is. Raise your hand. I don't know who that is. Yeah, we're having you raise your hand so the rest of us can laugh at you, you know, that you don't know. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. Listen, the, the most important influencer in our world at this moment is you because God's made you that way to be salt and light influence in the world around you. He's spreading influence of what is good and for the gospel. And so we're going to talk about that uh, for three weeks, starting two weeks from now. So I hope uh, that you'll be a part of that. Hey, listen, this summer has also been just an absolutely phenomenal summer of sharing the gospel in the world uh, across our globe. And so we have been in Guatemala and the Dominican Republic uh, uh, and El Salvador and in Cuba uh, uh, this summer so far. It's been an incredible uh, experience for many people who are just like you who've been a part of these mission teams. In fact, we have a really quick recap of our, of, uh, of our gospel for the world in these mission trips. I want you to watch it, and we're going to come back, and we're going to pray together. Watch this. Hey, Bear Creek. I'm so excited to share all that God has done this summer through our church and through our First Things First initiative. Over the last few months, members of our church have been working in the countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba in our desire to take the good news of Jesus Christ for the world. This summer, our teams traveled to El Salvador, where we began our partnership with a local church, beginning with a $50,000 commitment towards a mission center. Our teams worked on construction for the center, building bunk beds, finishing sheetrock, and installing lights. We also partnered with three other churches there to identify opportunities for our next Bear Creek team to come to El Salvador and continue our efforts through First Things First. We were also able to continue our ministry to the Dominican Republic. This year, our teams ministered to the people in the DR with many capacities, from VBS to providing food, visiting an orphanage, and even providing excellent dental and vision services at no cost. In fact, we believe we were able to provide over $40,000 of dental work alone, absolutely free of charge, for the people in this community. And we were able to do this because our church was able to purchase some crucial expensive dental equipment at a fraction of the cost that allowed our team to do some incredible dental work. Not only that, but we were able to provide over 60 people with vision care and even provide them reading glasses. And we just thank God for allowing us to minister to the medical needs of the people of the DR this year more than ever before. Our teams also continued our ministry in Guatemala. This year, we were able to provide food to the community and clean water by way of water filters there as well. Our teams also worked in construction in two homes, putting in concrete floors, building beds, installing siding, and many other construction projects. Not only that, but we were able to minister at various orphanages by sharing the love of Christ to children there and even had some incredible moments where we were able to effectively share the gospel to young ladies in a state-run orphanage. And our teams were so overwhelmed by the response to the gospel. Praise the Lord. And finally, to the country of Cuba, we were able to send support to 10 churches to equip them to share the gospel to children through VBS programs in the summer. And we were also able to equip them with chairs purchased by Bear Creek. Last year, over 2,000 children heard the gospel and about 500 prayed to receive Christ. 
and we believe this is because of the power of the gospel and because of our commitment to take the gospel to the world. We're excited to see how God continues to work through the generosity of every one of us who is part of Bear Creek to make Christ first. Yeah, that's the right response. All of this we've done uh, across the globe uh, in the name of Christ in order to bring the gospel of love, the gospel of God's love uh, to people all around us. And, and these teams have all been people just like you. But the reason they've been able to go is because of the generosity of all of us. Uh, the gospel generosity of all of us through first things first. And I just want to encourage you, church, Bear Creek, just keep investing. Just keep being as generous as you can to the work of Christ, not only in our community, but to the world. It makes a huge difference. And I'm grateful for you and so thankful that God is using uh, this church in such a phenomenal way. And so I'm going to ask our ushers to come, and we're going to give back to the Lord right now. And this is a moment of worship for us because this is a moment that we give ourselves we give ourselves as the offering and then we give out of our resources to the work of God and what he does in the lives around us. And so why don't we bow together and hey, this is a moment for you to welcome his presence into your heart and your mind. Don't block what he wants to do in you in this moment. And God, we thank you that you love us. God, we've seen you do such powerful things such incredible things in people's lives in this community and around the world through the power of the gospel. I mean, we've, we've witnessed it and we see it and we're blown away by it. And we just think it's incredible that you let us be a part of it. And this is a moment that we want to give to it. And we pray it now in Jesus name. Amen. Let's worship together. Where I found home You were there 
are great. You're greatly to be praised, Lord. You're worthy of all of our praise. And we just rejoice in the reality that you're faithful to your people, not a group of people, but your people, everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And we sing, great are you, Lord. Everything we got, we sing. It's your breath in our life. about your faithfulness all we can do is praise you you give life you are love you bring light you shine in your light you give hope to the hopeless to the broken and we know that you're great and greatly to be
worship you, Lord. God, this is why we worship you, Lord. When we think about your faithfulness, when we think about your goodness, when we think on the reality that, Lord, that you have saved us, that we were broken, that we were hopeless, that we were lost without you. But now we are found in you. Now we're made complete, we're made whole. And we have community with you, Lord. When we think of that, we have no choice but to worship you with our lives, with our voices, with our songs, with our hearts, Lord. So would you receive our praise this morning as you draw hearts, as you draw us closer to you, Lord, to a deeper relationship, a deeper trust of you, Jesus. Pray that your Holy Spirit would be present in this place, be tangible, and that it move us closer, closer, closer to more faith, to more trust, you, Jesus Christ. Speak to us now in this moment, Lord, and have your way and will in us. We believe you can, and we'll pray this in Jesus' name, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and your church says this morning, amen and amen. Hey, go ahead and grab your seat. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, it was supposed to be 12, but I've been in all of these services, and there was more than 12 baptized today, and so it's incredible. Um, I'm grateful that you're here. We're going to turn to the Word. Man, we've been in God's presence, and let's stay open to how He speaks into our lives. So we're in this series that's called Grow Strong. It's so significant in the life of our fellowship. It's 11 weeks long. I mean, it's hard for an American to pay attention to anything for three weeks, and we're going 11, 11 weeks because it's so crucial. It's so crucial to growing strong uh, as a Christ follower. And so, look, there's something you need to know about the strength of your faith, the, the tinsel strength of your faith, and that is that God has given you a set of resources that can help you grow through anything. Now, what I mean by that is no matter what you go through, he has already provided a set of resources that can make you grow through it. And that's really potent. I mean, think about that for a moment. He's created a set of resources that are good for anything you go through. They're, they're already delivered to you. You're already in possession of them. And all you have to do is take them out and make use of them because they are so powerful. The more you invest yourself into these resources, the more powerful, the more resourceful, the more resilient they make you. That's the power of them. But here's the problem. Most people underestimate them because they're so basic. Um, and they are basic. They're basic to your spiritual life like food is basic to your existence. Yeah, it's basic, but you have to have it. They're basic like water is basic to you, you know, staying alive. Uh, just like food and water, they, they can't affect you at all unless you fully nourish yourself on them. And so listen, the food, the water, the air of your spiritual life is the Word of God, prayer, and something else. They release an incredible power in your life. And today, 
we're going to pick up on the third one, the something else, the one more thing that brings incredible life to you and strength and power when you embrace this resource. And what is it? The Bible says in Acts 2, starting in verse 41, that next thing is spiritual community. It's community. But the nature of that community is spiritual. And so I want to show it to you in the very first moments that this phenomenon appeared in the New Testament church. And it happened the moment that the New Testament church was birthed. And so here is, uh, here is, here is Peter preaching the gospel. The Holy Spirit comes. The church is born. Uh, Peter preaches the gospel for the first time in this New Testament church, and more than 3,000 people pray to receive Christ. They put their faith in him and are baptized, and that's what Acts 2, starting in verse 41, says. So then, those who, have re- those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And so they, all of them, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had everything in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as as anyone might have need. And day by day continuing, and, and that phrase, day by day continuing, means that they continue to be together. They continue to devote themselves to these things. Everything that we just said they were doing, they kept on doing those things with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were we're being saved. Now, this is the Word of God, and the Word of God speaks with a supernatural power, and I, and I want to ask you to let it in today. Let it into your heart uh, and life, and watch this idea flow out of it. I mean, this message is about this passage, and this passage is about this, that growing up spiritually is just too hard and maybe too discouraging to attempt alone. In fact, your faith, your faith ought to come with a warning label. It ought to be hanging on you somewhere. And when you read that warning label about your faith, it should say you should not attempt this alone because, because you must live. Listen, you got to live in a deep, challenging, encouraging spiritual communi- uh, community or you'll never grow strong. And that's not an exaggeration, and that's not hyperbole. I'm telling you it's the truth, and I'm going to show you that it's the truth. And so I want us to define what this thing is, this phenomenon is. I want want to define spiritual community as an experience and then as a practice. So let's watch it as an experience and then uh, as a practice. And so let's define spiritual community. Number one, what is it? Number one, what is it? What is spiritual community? So Acts 2, 41 through 47 is describing it, but it's describing it in really, really practical terms. And I want to back out from that. In fact, I want to take a, a, like a, a, a large view. I want us to see spiritual community from everything that the New Testament says that it is. And I can give you, I can give you in a single sentence Everything that the New Testament says that spiritual community is. Here it is. It is, listen to this, it is the life of Christ in you uh, that's in other believers that you share together. It's the life of Christ in you that's in other believers that you share together. 1 Corinthians 12 says, that it connects you to one another in a supernatural way. Like all the parts of a human body are connected. You're a part of one another. Romans 12 says that it causes you, community, spiritual community, causes you to belong to one another in the way that you would say one of your kids belong to you. 
And the way that you would say your spouse belongs to you, that he or she belongs to you, that you belong to them. Philippians 2 says that this this phenomenon, spiritual community, it produces a oneness. For every Christ follower, it produces a oneness of heart and mind and spirit and purpose, and it causes you together to live like Christ. So that's what it is as a phenomenon. That's what it is as an experience. But what is it practically? What is it? That's what Acts 2 is showing us. And so if you look at a, a couple of phrases in the passage, I mean, it says in verse 42 that they were continually devoting themselves to something. That's going to tell you what it is as a practice. And that day by day, they were continuing. And so continually devoting, day by day, continue, continuing to continue to devote themselves. They were devoting themselves to something. They gave themselves over to something. Uh, it, means that, it means that they had completely immersed themselves into something, that they were rearranging their lives completely around something. And what was that something? Well, that something has four parts. It has four expressions. It has four practices. It has these four devotions. And that something is spiritual community. Now we're in the core of the teaching. I want you to see on the most practical level what uh, what spiritual community is through its four devotions. There are four devotions of spiritual community. And I want us to to look at them. You see them there in verse 42, that they devoted themselves to to the number one, to the apostles' teaching. To the apostles' teaching. What is that? What is it that they were devoting? If this is one element of spiritual community, and I want to experience spiritual community, what is it that I'm devoting myself to? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What is that? Well, these apostles had just finished a a three-and-a-half-year intensive, spiritual intensive, with Jesus himself. And they, and they were living out a familiar rhythm uh, in their culture and in their day that a rabbi would gather a, a group of close followers and he would completely duplicate his life into them. I mean, they would live together and he would constantly pour into them and he would give them the principles for living and how to live uh, and, and his philosophy and teaching. And Jesus operated like that. He's fully God and he's pouring into these, these 12 uh, disciples. And so what is, the, what is the apostles' teaching? It's everything Jesus taught them about how to live. And so they stand up and and so they say, well, what is it that Jesus taught us? Well, he, he taught us how to be a disciple. That's, how, that's what he, the apostles' teaching is, how to be a disciple. And so they start teaching it. So I think the foundational thing that Jesus taught us was that if I'm going to be a follower of his, that I've got to take up my cross and follow him and deny myself and live completely for him. The thing that Jesus taught us was to sit, to, to, to set our inner core, reset it on love, to focus my heart on loving God with all of it and learning to love everyone around me like I love, like I care for, like I nourish my own self. Um, he taught that I need to love my friends and I must love my enemies. He taught that I've got to become a radical forgiver. He taught that I've got to grow my kindness to be like the kindness of God. He taught uh, that I, I need to become generous like God. He taught that I need to become really serious about ridding sinful stuff out of me. I, I mean like eye-plucking, hand-cutting off serious. The hyperbole Jesus used to show this is how serious you should be about tearing like sinful stuff out of you. He taught that I should have the influence of salt and light in the world around me, or it will decay and go dark. And so they were continual. Listen to this. They were continually together focusing on who Jesus was calling them to become through the apostles' teaching, and it was alive and powerful, and they were hungry for it. I mean, uh, I mean that is a devotion of community that you should thirst for. 
But here's the second devotion. If you wanna experience spiritual community, first, devote yourself together to learning the, the apostles' teaching, but then secondly, to fellowship. Now, fellowship is a, <laughs> it is a synonym of spiritual community. It's the word koinonia. And so, so here, here, is a, uh, here is an element, here is a devotion uh, of spiritual uh, community. It's spiritual community. It's practicing spiritual community. It means to fully experience the thing that we share together, the life and presence of Christ. It means to fully experience that. What he's saying is in it, then I really intensely, um, I, I, I intensely focus on experiencing the life of Christ alongside others who know Christ as well. Uh, and when you're, when you're living in a true expression of this, where you're experiencing the life of Christ and you're fully experiencing that with another person or with some other people, I'm telling you, there is nothing like that experience. You know that the most fulfilling thing in the world is, what is it? You know that the most fulfilling thing in the world is, what? You know that the most fulfilling thing in the world is to know that you are deeply loved. And in spiritual, in this environment, in in an environment of spiritual community, It's there, and it's there in its deepest level, and it is irresistible. It deeply connects us together. It causes us to care for one another and love one another in a profound and unexpected way. The most, listen, the the most effective, the most powerful uh, spiritual revivals, uh, spiritual awakenings that have happened across history have usually had at its core a, 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 a really effective expression of, of spiritual community. And I know that, and I know, it by, I know it by experience. I've told you before, I was saved. I prayed to receive Christ. I put my faith in Christ during the last great spiritual awakening in American history. And that was during the Jesus movement. Now, a lot of you think, because you watched a movie uh, a lot of you think that the Jesus movement was, you know, hippies getting saved, you know, on the West Coast and being baptized in, in the Pacific Ocean. And do you know what? During, during the Jesus movement, hippies were being saved and were being baptized in the, in the Pacific Ocean. But so was little isolated rural little boys like me in West Texas being swept away by the Spirit of Christ, by the Spirit of God, because it was a movement of God across this nation. And I was a young teenager when I was saved and, and saved in the midst of that moment. And I want you to know the most palpable thing I remember and that, I, that lives in me today was how incredibly powerful and fresh and meaningful and how thirsty I was for it was, was, was the spiritual uh, fellowship, was the, the spiritual community I had with other believers. We could not wait to be together and to share what Christ was doing in us and praying for each other and over each other and just just expressing the love of Christ in community. That's That's the second. There is a third. There's a third devotion in spiritual community, and that is the breaking of bread, the breaking of bread. So this can mean one or two things, and and Bible interpreters are a little bit split on this. Some would say it means that they were taking the Lord's Supper together. Others would say that, uh, that they were breaking bread and that they were sharing meals together. And, and, you know, I really want this to mean that it was, uh, it was that they were having the Lord's Supper together. And there was probably an aspect of it, but more than likely, if you just are straight with the grammar and honest with the interpretation, it probably means they were eating together. And then later, verse 46, it says that. They were, they were meeting house to house, eating together with incredible joy and gladness. It means they were constantly together for meaningful moments. 
a, listen, a routine. Did you hear it? A routine of meaningful moments. And so, right, that's the first century. In the 21st century, what do you know, that, what do you know about social sciences, what the social sciences say about having a routine meal with those that you love? I mean, there is a ton of research that, that, that says, I mean, it's like unmistakable that, that it makes almost every measurement of happiness and joy and fulfillment soar in your life when you live in a routine of sharing a meal with those that you love. And it protects you. The the social sciences say it. It protects you from the harmful effects of what isolation does to you. You know, the effects of it, depression and, and accumulated anxiety and stress and a lot more. Uh, there's this healthy, incredibly healthy, fulfilling routine that's found in spiritual community. It's called breaking bread. It means sharing meals together in meaningful ways. But there's a fourth, and the fourth is, it's the fourth devotion of, of spiritual community, and that is, it says, and to prayer. Do you see it? It's at the end, and to prayer. I mean, this is shared prayer. This is where constantly they were gathering to pray, to simply pray together. It's prayer in community. Uh, and, and, and in that environment, there's like this accumulated faith effect, and it begins to have this huge result. And so there, there is care poured out in, in an incredibly deep level. I mean, to have the vulnerability to ask others to go to God for something you really need, and then, listen, listen, and then to be there when they go into the the presence of the creator of the universe, and you hear them care for you in prayer, and you hear them to ask the one who loves you most to move and work in your life, and then later to see God move in response to it, there is nothing more powerful than that in your life. The power of these four devotions is that it was transforming them. It was transforming them. Um, How do I know that? Verse 43 says, here's the transforming effect. Everyone was feeling a sense of awe. They'd fallen into wonder. Now look, that's not typical. We can test that. We're going to do a class. We're going to do a class response here. How many? How many of you this last week? I mean, fell into utter awe and wonder seven times this last week. Three times. One time. It's not typical to live in a sense of awe and wonder. Something so wonderful they were overcome with the reality of what God was doing in their lives. I mean, I don't fully understand it, but experiencing Christ in his presence through the practice of community produces awe and wonder. And you need that in your life. You need these four devotions and you you need to package these four devotions and and you you need to put together a group, formal or informal. You need to attach to a to a set of other believers around you uh, and say, I want to practice these things together because you need it. You need the wisdom of other spiritually mature people in your life. You need the care of others in your life and you need the trouble of caring for others who are a little bit annoying uh, in your life as well. And you need the power of shared prayer and to see it in the the power of a community. You, You need to be thirsty for the four devotions of community of teaching, of closeness, of breaking a bread, of shared prayer. But let's move to the second. And that second question is, why do I need it? Why do I need it? And that's what's happening in verses 43 through 45, and I'm gonna start shrink-wrapping 
these concepts now. I'm going to go faster and faster. The point, the point of these verses is, is that their life became different instantly. Their lives became different instantly. And yes, it is because the presence of Christ came into them individually, but it's not just that. It was equally powerful because they became a spiritual community that was practicing these four things. And they began, uh, their lives were radically changed uh, as a result. They were living with a palpable sense of wonder and awe. They were watching God do miraculous things. They were radically sharing their possessions with one another. I mean, this is radical stuff. It's not that they went to their closet and dug out all the extra stuff that they haven't seen in a year and a half or 12 years and gave it away to some people. They were selling their property. They were selling what they lived on and sharing it with others. Pretty radical. And they were full of joy. Have you been in a crowd of people lately? I'm just asking. I mean, the people that you see, the crowd of people you see at Walmart. The line that you're in at the, fa- at the fast food restaurant. Everywhere else you go, I mean, I mean, right, is that your experience? I mean, is your experience, you know, everywhere I go, people just seem to be so full of joy. Yeah, it's different. It's fundamentally different to live in fellowship, in spiritual community. I mean, my point, listen, I, I, let me get to it. Why, why do I need it? Because it is literally healing. It is literally healing. That's the point. Everything, everything that makes you sick, how much you isolate yourself, how little res- resilience you have for hard things, how anxious and depressed you are, the addictions developed in secret. All of those can be demonstrably healed through the life of Christ in you, shared in community. It's astounding and it's supernatural. That's why you need it. But let me give you the last, and again, I'm going to shrink wrap. Here it is, number three. So how do I do it? How do I do spiritual community? How do I do it? Well, you see a repeated word, and and the single word is all you need. And so 244, all those who believed were together. Verse 46, day by day, continuing, meaning continuing together with one mind in the temple, house to house. They were together with gladness and sincerity of heart. And so, so how do I do it? Here's how you do it. You just become radically together. You turn your life from the spiritual isolation that it is, and you develop a community. If it's a community of three or five or seven or 14, you develop a circle of, of other believers who want the nature, who want the center of your relationship to be this. We want to experience the four devotions, a spiritual community, and we want it to grow us into disciples of Jesus. I'm going to say this last thing. Without general, gen, genuine spiritual community flowing into your life, I'm being serious here. I, I, you know, it doesn't do me any good to exaggerate or, you know, I don't know, oversell. I, it, it doesn't do anything for me. But I want to tell you the truth. Without genuine spiritual community flowing into your life, you're probably not going to make it spiritually. And here's, here's why I know it. It's what I've watched. It's what I see. I mean... When church becomes a consumer product, when church is a consumer experience, it's a huge disappointment. And the reason why is nothing changes in your life. It is only, listen, it is only the shared experience of walking with Christ uh, where you're building one another up and devoted to the four devotions that your life will change radically. Uh, I, I read years ago, the, the top Christian 
counselor in, in, in academics in America. He had started several graduate programs of Christian counseling. He came to this realization, it was just this dawning on him, that he was in the counselor office and that he was in a small group. In the counselor office and in a small group. And he started to discover, I'm seeing more life change in the small group than I am in the counselor's office. And he's a counselor. And he trains counselors. And I think counseling is good. I think it's excellent. All I'm doing is I'm just illustrating, look at the power, the life-changing power of just being in community. And God calls you to it. Let's bow together. We're going to pray right here. Please don't waste the moment. Let me show you how to waste the moment. Start thinking, what's next? That's how you waste this moment. Would you live in this moment for just a second? And just embrace how much you need community, spiritual community. And would you bring online, would you just bring to your heart and mind a level of commitment that you're going to create it in your life? Maybe you're already in a group and maybe that group isn't all that it should be. You go be the difference. Maybe you're not in a group and you're like spiritually isolated. Start picking people out and say, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna create an environment of spiritual community, and I want you in it, because I need you in it. Make that commitment right now, and Father, I wanna thank you for the perfect, the perfect community that we see with you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit in perfect community. God, I ask you to help us in some imperfect way to mimic that community and feel the joy, the awe, the care, transformation that comes from living in spiritual community. We pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.